Living Translation, Acts 16, 6. New Living Translation. Here we go. Next, Paul and Silas travel through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Now let me look back at this and restate what I read earlier. Paul and Silas, Silas travels through the area of Phrygia and Galatia. The Holy Spirit, I want you to hear this, prevents them from preaching the word. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, I want you to hear what we're reading, prevents them from preaching the word there. So they keep moving on this journey, and they head toward Bithynia, but again, the Holy Spirit does not allow them to go there to preach the word. Wow. The Holy Spirit is stopping somebody from going to a place to spread his word, the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that today. I want, I want, to, I want to, to speak to you today from the subject, when the Spirit says no. <laughs> when the Spirit says no. <laughs> No, I don't want you to marry her. No, I don't want you to work there. No, I don't want you to go there. No, I don't want you to hang out with that person. No, I don't want you to do whatever it may be. The Spirit of God is saying no. Let's talk about that. Father God in heaven, I thank you today for being with us. You said where there are two or three gathered together in your name that you would be in the midst. So there's more than two or three of us, Father, and I thank you that we carry your spirit and we, are, we know that you are in the midst. And so our hearts are open, our, our ears are open, our eyes are open, our minds, we're open now, Father, to receive what the spirit of the living God is saying to us today. So I pray, God, that you would bless every heart, you would bless every soul, and that the word that's planted would not be stolen, but Father God, it would bring forth a seed that would be planted in our hearts and would produce a fruitful harvest. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When the Spirit says no. There's so much I want to say, I don't even know where to start, guys. But I'm just going to start. We just going to roll. <laughs> Y'all ready? Yeah. I think that the most 
misunderstood and ignored subject or topic in Christianity, in the church, amongst believers, is the topic or subject of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's the most misunderstood. People don't understand it. I believe that it is the most ignored because we as human beings have a tendency to not want to deal with things that we don't understand. We also have a tendency to not want to <laughs> deal with topics where we're a little afraid of what may be said. We're also a little concerned about understanding enough to where we are now required and we have to obey certain things that we may not want to be accountable to or obey. So therefore, if I don't know about it, if I close my ears, if I act like I don't understand it, if I don't go there, then I won't be accountable for it because I, don't, I won't know about it. So I'd rather for you not to tell me because I don't want to have to deal with that particular subject matter. When I was growing up, my definition of Holy Spirit was based off of hearing the older people in the church I grew up with talk about him and to see the activity that they said, this is the Holy Spirit. Now, if I was to still base my understanding of the Holy Spirit based off of what I saw and heard, I would be messed up still today. <laughs> because I saw some crazy stuff happen in the church that they said, this is the Holy Spirit. I saw people acting crazy. And I thought, if this is the Holy Spirit, I don't want him or need him because <laughs> I don't want to act like that. I don't want to be foaming. I don't want to be rolling. I don't want to be <laughs> carrying on. I don't, I don't, I don't, no, 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 no. I don't, if that's what the Holy Spirit is, is coming to make me do, I don't want, I don't want that. So it was a little fear there. Now, when I read the scriptures, it was totally different. And that's why, listen to me, it's so critical and important that we stop listening to people who don't know what they're talking about. You don't know they don't know what they're talking about because we don't do our own personal reading and research because we would rather go to YouTube and have somebody tell us what they already studied and for us to believe them because we don't want to put in the work. But if we were to put in the work and do the reading and do the studying, we would find out that a lot of things you listening to on YouTube, a lot of things you heard from your old church, your old pastor, that, that some of them were, it was, they were ignorant. They, ignorant is not a bad word. It just means they didn't know. They did the best with what they knew. And now that knowledge is, is so widespread and so much greater and we have access to so much more, there's a lot we know, a lot more that we understood than the generations before us. Just because knowledge has covered the earth in such an uh, expanded and huge way. But the Holy Spirit, I had to study to find out what is this what is this whole idea of understanding? Because there's no way we're going to understand the text today unless we understand the Holy Spirit. Because if the Spirit is leading me, what is that Spirit? What, who is that Spirit? What is that Spirit about? So, so I did a teaching a few years ago. It's actually on our YouTube channel. It's called Leadership of the Holy Spirit. I don't have the time to go to the depth of talking about the Holy Spirit, its purpose, 
why God gave it to us, what it's supposed to accomplish. But if you go and you want to really delve into the person of the Holy Spirit, I would encourage you to go to that particular um, teaching on our YouTube channel called Leadership of the Holy Spirit because that will really break down more so than what I'm going to share. I'm going to share just enough to give us a platform so it can lift us off where we need to go and what we need to get to that. So, the Holy Spirit that we have to understand first is not an it. It's not a thing. It's not some force. It's not some win. It's not some It's, it's not that because we, we picture that. We hear things, we see things, and we're like, oh, this is mysterious. This is, is that him? Is that it? Is that, is that what I feel? Is that him? You know, we don't know. And so we have to first understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Bible refers to him as part of the Godhead. It refers to him as he. He. And it gives them name, names like the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter. All of those names are identifying the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. And so when you talk about God and you leave out the Holy Spirit, you're missing a huge part of who God is. So people know God, and we, if we had to break it down, there's God, the Father. Everybody knows the Father, right? God, the Father. Okay, let me put a capital, capital F, right? And then we have Jesus. Oh, we can talk about Jesus, the Son of God. And then we got the Holy Spirit. These three make up what we call the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They make up the Godhead, and they all are three forms of God, but yet God is one. That's the mystery here that people are challenged with. How can God take on three forms and yet still be God? Now, if we could answer every question about God, then we would be God. But God doesn't allow us to know every single, understand every single thing. If you're the type of person where I ain't going to believe it unless I understand it, you're in trouble. Now, it's crazy how you say that when it comes to God, but there's a whole bunch of stuff you don't understand that you deal with every single day of your life. <laughs> Am I right? You don't know how it works. You don't know why it works, but you're working it. But when it comes to God, all of a sudden, I got to understand every, every particle, every concept, every particle. Otherwise, I just can't believe. That's the that's lie of the enemy. So God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5 and 7 explains the Holy Spirit this way. He says that there are three. Don't forget this scripture, 1 John 5 and 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. There are three that bear record in heaven. Who are the three that bear record in heaven? The Father, the Word. We're going to talk about who the Word is. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. It's another name for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost. Ghost is a spirit. And then it goes on to say, and these three are one. These three are one. Stay with me. Matthew 28, 19 says something interesting. We've read it before, but I want you to understand it in the context of what we're talking about as God being three in one, all right? Matthew 28, 19 says, I want you to go and I want you to make disciples and I want, to, I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. I want you to baptize. Baptize means I want them to be submerged, submerged, taken over, in, through, by the Father, the Son, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks as the Father being God, Jesus as being God, 
and the Holy Spirit as being God. If you read the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, it will refer to God as God, the Father. It will refer to Jesus as God, and it will refer to the Holy Spirit as God. Keep reading. Jesus, Genesis 1 and 26 says this. Genesis 1 and 26 says, God said, now God, singular, said, watch this, let us. Why would God say, God singular, say let us, unless there was more to him than what we understand or comprehend? So God said, let us. When he said us, he's referring to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let us, watch this, let us make mankind in, not my image, our image, and in our likeness, and let them have complete authority over the earth, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts in the field, everything that creeps on the earth. Our, we want to give that to man. Let us make man in our image. Now, still, that's, that's a challenge for some people to still kind of understand. Okay, God said, singular, let us, and he's plural. How, how I, I'm still trying to understand it. All right, we want to understand it fully, but we understand it better. How many want to understand it better? All right, so I'm on a, you know I am not a drawer. Okay, don't talk about my drawing. Okay, but I, I don't even, I'm going to attempt this. Y'all don't talk about your pastor. This is not his gift. Okay? This ain't his gift. But how many can figure what this has? It is. The, the fast version. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. The sun. So we're going to use the sun in order to try to understand God. This was the best explanation I ever, you know, someone gave me the explanation to try to understand how God functions. And they said, you know, there's a, the three-leaf clover. I mean, what, there's a, and, and there's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're all connected, but there's, there's it's three leaves. And I was like, okay, that's okay. I, I get it. They're, they're, they're three po different points, but they're all connected. Okay, okay, that's, that's okay. But then I heard this explanation, and I was like, I like this better. The Son is God. Now, the light of the sun is Jesus, the Son of God. The heat of the sun is the Holy Spirit. You cannot have the sun without having heat. You cannot have, yeah, the sun without having light. You cannot have light without the sun. You cannot have heat without the sun. So, so, so they're all God, but they're all expressed in a different way, but they're all interconnected still. You can't have one without the other. But they, they materialize or manifest in different ways, but they're all coming from the same source. Good God. They're coming from the same source. So God manifests or reveals himself, but he's always represented as God in, in all three, in, in the Father, in the Son, Jesus, and in the Holy Spirit. And, and any time one is there, they're representing all of them because you can't have one there without having the rest there. So when you're dealing with the Father, you're dealing with the Son and the Holy Spirit. When you're dealing with the Holy Spirit, you're dealing with the Father and the Son. When you're dealing with the Son, you're dealing with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Though you may be, seem like you're only dealing with one, you can't have one without having the other. Because they're interconnected. Anybody learning anything? So to better understand this, let's look at the Old Testament example. Let's look at one Old Testament example and one New Testament example of the Godhead, how the Godhead works. In the Old Testament, y'all ready to go a little bit deeper in this? In the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 1, the first, 
Even people who don't go to church know where Genesis chapter 1 is. Any people who don't go to church can say, uh, I know Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I can do that one. I know what the Bible says in the beginning, the first words, in the beginning God created. All right, so if we look at that, let's, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. The earth, watch this. This, 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 I'm confused now a little bit when I got to start studying and reading verse 2. God created the heaven and earth. Hallelujah. The earth was formless. <laughs> And void. Oh, man. The earth was formless and void and empty, and darkness covered the waters. I'm going to tell you why. I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that, trying to understand that. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. I'm showing you in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, that God is represented and seen the Father, the Son, S-O-N, and the Holy Spirit. I'm showing you this in Genesis chapter 1, if, that God created the heavens, the earth was formed, this empty darkness, and the Spirit of God was, was the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the waters. Now watch this. God said, let there be light. That's the first thing he said. How many glad... That's the first thing he said, let there be light. Now, um, now, let me get ahead of myself. Let me finish it. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, because it always is what God says it is. And God separated the light from the darkness that we just read earlier. And God called the light day, and he called the dark night. Hmm. I'm a little concerned about this because when I study the scriptures, it says that God is perfect and that God is a God of order and that God, there's no darkness in him. Yet, he creates the heavens and earth, and then the next thing it says after he creates the heaven and earth is the earth that he created is dark and has no form and it's empty and void. All of those characteristics are the opposite of who God is. So I'm trying to understand how is it that God creates the heaven and the earth, and then next he, it says the earth is now formless and void and empty and darkness is covering the whole thing. Wait a minute, something had to happen in between God creating the heavens and the earth who's perfect and everything he creates, even as you keep reading, it says, God says, let there be this, and it was that, and it was good. He don't create anything bad. So that means that God created the heavens and earth, and when he created them, they were good. But something had to happen in between that sentence and the next sentence because all of a sudden the earth is void and empty, and darkness is covering the deep, and there's confusion there. What happened? Well, I'm, that's going to tie that in to, to, to all three being represented because we don't... We don't see, when we read this first verse in Genesis, we see the Father speaking. We see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. But where's Jesus? Jesus comes into the picture when, when God says, let there be light. He comes into the picture. Well, well how, do you, how do you get that? How do you get that, Pastor Ben? Because, watch this, when you read Genesis chapter 1 and it says that God said, let there be light, how many have read that and assumed that God had some light that was in the sky that, that, so light could, could come into the place? Here's the problem. God says in the first verse, let there be light, but then God doesn't make the sun to the fourth day.
God doesn't make the sun, he doesn't make the moon, he doesn't make the stars until the fourth day. So my question to you today is if God said let there be light and the light he divided from the darkness and the light he called day and the dark he come night, he's not talking about physically on the earth a light and a dark. He's talking spiritually the light of the world. Jesus said I am the light of the world versus the darkness of the enemy. Now how did the enemy get in there? Because if God created heaven and earth perfectly and then there's formless and there's void and darkness covered over the deep. What happened is if we study the scripture, and Jesus said in Luke, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That means he hit the ground. He in the earth. In Job, Jesus, uh, uh, Satan appears in, uh, uh, in front of God, and God said, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro through the earth, up and down it. The devil goes about on the earth like a, pro, like a lion prowling, right, seeking whom he may devour. The way the earth becomes formless and void and dark is because Satan rebels in heaven and he's kicked down to the earth. He is the darkness that has now entered the earth that is, that is being seen. And God is creating and God says now, spiritually, we know what just happened. That, that darkness appeared in heaven, and that can't stay there. It got kicked down to the earth, and so now the earth I created perfect has the enemy down there who's full of darkness operating, but I got a plan. My plan is in the midst of the darkness, I'm going to speak, let there be light. See, before I can create anything on the earth, before I can make the moon and sun and the stars and for seasons and days and times, before I give the birds the sky and the expanse and the rain and all of that, I got to deal with this spiritual problem. So the light that I say, let there be, I'm not reflecting a light for the people. I'm bringing my son into the picture. When I said, let there be light, I'm bringing Jesus to the forefront. <laughs> and so there we have it. So we understand there that God is speaking, that the Holy Spirit is hovering or brooding over the earth, and that Jesus is shining. God is speaking, Jesus is shining, and the Holy Spirit is hovering. Wow. So when we keep going and we look in the New Testament, it says that um, before we go to the New Testament, in Isaiah 92, it says the people in the earth, this is a prophetic word, the people in the earth who walk in darkness will see a great light. Who are they talking about? For those who live in a land of deep darkness on the earth, a light is going to appear. It's prophetically declaring that this Jesus who God spoke in the beginning, let there be light, is going to now manifest and appear on the earth. And people who are walking in darkness is going to see the light. Matthew 4 and 16 said, The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, a light has sprung up. Jesus appears on the scene. That's why Jesus declares in John 8 and 12, I am the light of the world. See, when we understand this, it gives whole new meaning to Jesus speaking, I am the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. Wow. So in the New Testament, we see the Godhead together again in the baptism of Jesus. In the baptism of Jesus, here we go again, God is speaking. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, follow him. God is speaking. Jesus is obeying the Father, being baptized by John the Baptist. He's coming up out of the water. There's a light that appears. Jesus is there. God is there. And who comes down like a dove? The Holy Spirit. You're not going to get one without getting the others. They all work together. Look at somebody say, they all work together. So, so, so there's a problem when we got believers in Christ saying, well, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the Holy Spirit. No 
How? How? The Bible teaches us that the believer has been, and I need to write this. Sorry, I got to get rid of you, old beautiful son. You I did such a wonderful job. <laughs> that the Bible teaches us that we've been uh, reconciled to God. Okay? We've been redeemed. We, we look, the, there's a scripture in, in the Psalms that says, uh, I will lift my eyes to the hills from what's come in my help. We, we look to God. We're, we, we pray to God, right? Everything is to God. But when it comes to, to the second part of the Godhead, everything is done in Christ. As believers, everything we do is to God, but it's done in Christ. Another word we can put here is it's done in Christ or through Christ. So everything we do as believers in Jesus Christ, as believers, Christians, we do to God. We pray to God. We, we lift our eyes to God, but we do everything through Christ. That's why it teaches us when we pray, what did Jesus say? How to pray? Our Father. We're praying to God. How do we end the prayer? In Jesus' name. Everything we do is to God, but it's in Christ. Now watch this. We're not done. We got to get all three of them in. And it's by the Holy Spirit. You cannot worship God without the Holy Spirit. Not truly worship him, because he says, uh, I'm looking for worshipers who worship me in spirit and in truth. You know, a lot of people you see worshiping God, they're worshiping him in the flesh. I don't, God says, I don't receive people who worship me in their flesh who worship me according to their feelings, who worship me according to their, uh, their mindsets, who worship me according to their intellect. No, you got to go through the Spirit. You got to worship by the Spirit because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is pure worship, and God only receives from us pure worship. That's how he's able to distinguish be between worship that is defiled and worship that is holy. <laughs> so we do, we, we got the God here. You see the God here? To God in Christ by the Holy Spirit. To God in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Everything we do as a believer, we do to God in and through Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now, that means we need the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that means we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. That means I can't live a Christian life without the Holy Spirit. That means I will not be effective and efficient, and I will not see fruit without the Holy Spirit. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So everything is done. So now... Today at our churches, guess who gets all the attention? The Father. God gets all the attention. You got to be careful when people say God because you don't know what God they're talking about. You got to ask them when they say God, God is good. Which God are you talking about? Is you talking about the God of the Bible or are you talking about another God? They'll say, well, I'm talking about the God of the Bible. Then you have to discern if the things that they're referring to the God of the Bible, if those things match up with him. Because now they're not confused. In other words, they're not taking the God of the Bible and they made him something that he's not. And so you have to be careful and make sure what God are we talking about. But everybody, even if people who, who understand the same God, we're on the same page, even then... You're talking about God. <laughs> he gets all the attention. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, he's the Father. What burns me up, not burns me up, but it just, it's my soapbox, I guess, is when I hear people praying this, God, come by, Lord. Come by, God. Come on down. We need you, God. 
God, come by here. God, we, we need, we're calling on you. Come on by. And I'll be cracking up and saying to myself, that sounds good. Sounds nice and spiritual, but it's not scripturally accurate. Because God ain't coming by. You know why he's not? What, is the, what does the Lord's prayer say? Our Father, who art where? He's where? Why are you asking him to come down? And the Bible's already made it clear where he is. Now, the other person that gets all the attention is Jesus. Come by here, Lord. Lord, we need you. Lord, enter into Lord, and we get it when we say that. We know we're saying we want to his spirit, right? Because y'all all will faint and fall out and die if Jesus walked through that door right now. <laughs> so we understand when they're praying that they're not expecting anybody physically, Jesus, to come on the scene. But, but even praying like that is wrong because the Bible teaches us. I can give you several scriptures right now to let you know where is Jesus at right now. That's what the Bible teaches. He's at the right hand of the Father. Guess what? He ain't getting up until it's time for him to come back. So stop calling on him to come. He ain't coming. That's not scriptural. He's not coming until he returns to the earth, until he comes to pick up his bride and meet them in the air, and then he returns to the earth to deal with the wickedness and the unrighteous and the sinner. Until that time comes, stop. Come on by here. He ain't coming. Stop. God gets all the attention. Jesus gets all the attention. But most people don't know nothing about the Holy Spirit. Now, it's critical because God is in heaven. The Bible teaches that. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. He's done. Somebody look at somebody and say, He's done. He's, done. He's finished. It's your turn now. Stop calling on him to do stuff for you that he already did for you, and now he said it's your turn to do what I did, and even greater than I did, because I go away. I'm going away, and it's good. He said it's expedient. It's beneficial that I go away. He says because if I don't go away, guess who can't come? God help us. The Holy Spirit can't come. He said, it's good. I know y'all sad, y'all crying, y'all don't want to see me leave, but I'm going to prepare a place for you so that when I come and get you, you can be where I am. But I ain't going to leave you as orphans, and I'm not going to leave you without comfort, and I'm not going to leave you without power, and I'm not going to leave you without direction. God, I feel like preaching. I'm not going to leave you all by yourself. I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to send the spirit of truth. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to be with you. He's going to remind you of what I told you. He's going to tell you what to do in every situation. He's going to lead you down the path you need to go. He's going to carry you wherever you need to be carried. God, help. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Oh, so people are ignoring Jesus and people are resisting the Holy Spirit, but you don't understand. You can't make it without him. He is Jesus on the earth. He is the one that, see, I love it. Jesus had a plan. You know, we need to get a plan. Jesus had a plan. He's like, how do I get, because I'm here, and everywhere I go, there's 10,000 people following me, and there's people grabbing on me, and they, I, I took them to your disciples. They couldn't heal them. Jesus, can you heal them? And I got to go everywhere. I got to do everything. I got a plan to make it where I can be in everybody at the same time who believes on me so that miracles, can happen on a multiplication level, on a greater level. God had a, he had a plan. He said, this is going to be better for, you don't understand it. I know y'all love me. You want me to stay with you, but I got to leave for my plan to work. <laughs> See, you thinking singular and I'm thinking multiplication. You thinking addition, I'm thinking multiplication. I can't be everywhere at the same time in this flesh, but my Holy Spirit can be everywhere at the same time. He says, my spirit, 
lives and dwells in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. The Holy Spirit is living inside of you. So now you can do everything that I need done. He passes the mantle. He passes the scepter. Jesus passes the scepter each to each and every one of those who believes on him and puts their trust in him. Praise the Lord. So we see the Holy Spirit is not an option, y'all. There are some people who believe that the Holy Spirit only belongs to certain people. This is the lie that the enemy uses to keep people from being able to receive the Holy Spirit and live by the Spirit of God. They, 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 the, the, the enemy tells them that, see, you, the reason why they, because they, they have the gift, it's a special gift. No, there is a special administrative gift that is in Corinthians and Ephesians that talks about the body of Christ and the gifts, like the gift of hospitality, the gift of administration, the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, the gift of prophecy. And there are gifts that specifically deal with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues. But that is separate from the gift that God has made available to every believer, and the promises are there, especially in the book of Acts, where God says, whoever believes on me, out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. That God says, whoever believes on me, I'm going to baptize you, and I'm going to fill you with my spirit. On the day of Pentecost, everybody got filled. Paul went somewhere and said, have you guys heard, we ain't, have you guys been filled with the Holy Spirit since you believed? Now, if it was only for certain individuals, why would he tell the whole group? Anybody here been filled with the Holy Spirit? They're like, we haven't even heard of it. He said, I'm going to tell you about the Holy Spirit, and then I'm going to pray and lay hands on you, and you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He told them about it. He prayed and laid hands, and not two out of ten, not three out of seven. Everybody got filled with the Spirit. The promise was made to you and to your children and to their children. Jesus says it this way. He said, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more me, the heavenly father in heaven, who is all perfect and good, will he not give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now, he's talking about different gifts on the world. Then he says, when I give you a gift, he mentions the Holy Spirit. Why did he mention the Holy Spirit? How come he didn't mention a house? How come he didn't mention a car? I didn't mention a good marriage, good relationship. Because listen, he, he, he's trying to let you in on a secret. The best gift that he could give you, God have mercy, is the Holy Spirit. So he don't use anything. He, he tells you, I'm a good father, and a good father is going to give you the very best gift that you can get. And the gift, the best gift that I can give you is my Holy Spirit. God. So there are people who say, I don't know, he feels certain people and other people don't believe that lie. That's the enemy's attempt or way of cheating you out of your inheritance as a believer. It's to get you to believe that it's not for you, it's only for certain people. It's his way of cheating you out of your inheritance that God has promised you. It's your portion. It's your portion. How many want that portion? So the, the Holy Spirit is so necessary because it separates religion and ritual from relationship and reality. The Holy Spirit is what separates religion and rituals from relationship and reality. There's a lot of people in religion, and they, they are stuck there because they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They won't embrace the Holy Spirit. They resist the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, you don't have any freshness of God. How many here like bread that's been seven days old been sitting out? 
If I had to ask you, you want that bread or do you want this bread that we just got out of the oven? Which one are you going to choose? You, know, you want the fresh baked, right? The Holy Spirit always gives you the latest, the freshest, the best. It's on the cutting edge. Religion always gives you what's dead, old, stale. So you'll be able, maybe you can't, Pastor Ben, I can't, tell the tr- I can't tell the difference between religion and, and, and a relationship with Jesus. Uh, after being at this church, go to some other churches. Walk in there. Walk in, I ain't going to talk about them, but walk into a Catholic church. You, t- you tell me. You tell me if this is a relationship in reality or is it religion and rituals. You tell me if you send something fresh and new, are you, are you feel like you, you old and broken? Amen. The Holy Spirit empowers us. Jesus said this to his disciples. You need the Holy Spirit. He says, don't even leave Jerusalem where, we, where we're meeting at. Don't leave until the Father sends the gift that he has promised. In a few days, you are going to be submerged. You are going to be overtaken. You are going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And then you will be my witnesses all over the world telling people about me. Now watch this. But when you tell people about me, because they were telling people about them before, what is the difference between when we get the Holy Spirit? You don't want us to go tell nobody yet. You want us to stay here and just keep praying and wait for the Holy Spirit. You don't want us to just, at least if we're out there telling somebody that somebody will get something, you know, until the Holy Spirit comes. He said, no, I don't even want you to go and tell nobody yet about me, the gospel, until you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit gives you power. It's the difference between telling somebody something without power and telling somebody something with power. Because guess what? It's not your, if you, anybody done any evangelism, no. It's not your telling. It's the power behind your telling that causes God to move in the situation and cause that person to be convicted and the person to realize, I need Jesus. It ain't you. Wow. It ain't your verbiage. It ain't your intellect. It ain't your ability to be able to have a, be a great wordsmith and say the right things and have the right formula. It's the power. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. <laughs> So God says, I want you to go when you got power. We got too many churches that are going with no power. We got too many people who call themselves a Christian with a cross and a fish on the back of their car with no power. This is why the world looks at the church and says, the church got nothing to offer me because they don't see no power. They don't see no power over the demons that are tormenting you. They don't see no power and victory in your life when it comes to sickness and health. They don't see no power in your life when it comes to discipline. They don't see no power in your life and how you treat other people. So they're like, I don't want nothing to do with it. God says your problem is you need the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit has come. One of its main focuses is to give you power. Now, here's the other Here's the other reason we got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit powers us. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, directs us into all truth, John 16 and 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, this is before he came, he's here now. He will guide you into all truth, and I'll speak on his own, but what he hears from heaven, he will declare to you. John 15 and 26, Jesus says, he's going to testify about me. And then Jesus goes on to say, it's good that I go because the Spirit will come, lead you, guide you, direct your steps from here out. Now, I love this because Psalms 37 and 23 says, the steps, God help me, the steps of a good righteous man are ordered, are directed, are established by the Lord, and God delights in his path. He blesses his way. The steps of a righteous man, the ste- any righteous people in here? Yes. 
God says, now we're getting close to our text. I, I know I'm going long. The steps of a righteous man, the Bible said, are ordered. Right. Ordered, are directed, are led by who? God. God. They're led by God. But God is where now? Yeah. And Jesus is where? Yeah. And so who's here? God the Holy Spirit, if I'm a righteous man and my steps are being ordered by God, they're being uh, ordered and led by God the Holy Spirit. The next scripture I love, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge the Lord. In all of your ways, ask the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit, and what will he do? He will give direction on what path we ought to take, where we ought to go, where we ought to move, what's next, what, we're, what we need to do now. I love this, Romans 8, 14. Listen, those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God, sons and daughters of God. Who, who, who are the children and sons of God? Those who are led by the Holy, the Holy Spirit. So how in the world is God leading you and you don't believe in the Holy Spirit? You're not embracing the Holy Spirit, which is God in the earth today. In our text today, all that just to set up our text. The Apostle Paul and his companions are on a mission trip to Asia Minor, and they are traveling there to strengthen disciples all over the areas they're going to. And they have been previously on mission trips, so this was not their first. And so some of the places they were going, they were going to strengthen the disciples that they had already converted before and check on them to see how they were doing. They also were going to new places that they hadn't been before, and they were preaching the gospel to those so that they can bring more people to Jesus Christ. And so there they are on their way, strengthening the church and telling more people about Jesus. And so as they're traveling from place to place, doing the Lord's work, on their way to one particular place, the Lord tells them, don't go. <laughs> Don't go. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, tell them, don't go there. And they're like, okay. I, I, we're sensing the Holy Spirit say, don't go there. We'll go, go this way. Go to Bithynia. They go through that way, and the Holy Spirit says to them again, don't go there either. Mm. Why is God telling his servants no in their attempt to minister? Now, I understand if they were going somewhere they had no business going. Right, we all get that. We know we're going somewhere. We know we ain't supposed to be going. We're going to look at something we ain't supposed to be looking at. We're going to connect with people we ain't supposed to be connecting with. And the Spirit of God is eating you up because you know I shouldn't walk out of this house. I should not go there. I should not make that call. I should not do that. We all know about that. We, we expect God to stop us when we are trying to proceed in a direction or way that we know does not agree with him. But now we are dealing with a situation that we know God wants us to preach. God called us and chose us and entitled us and, and, and blessed us last time we came here. So, so, of course, he wants us to do this. This is going to exalt him. It's going to glorify him. It's going to lift him up. But yet he's telling them, don't go. Now, if they're like some of us, they're going to go anyway. Because many of us Function with God on presumption. Because we know more than God. <laughs> and we're so stuck to legalism and the law, so we're not even open to the Holy Spirit directing and guiding us. We just have made up in our mind where the Bible says that we're supposed to preach the gospel. So therefore, we just got to preach the gospel. And we just going. We know it's God. I know it's God. Prophets all around telling you don't go. I know it's God. It's in the word. What do you do 
when God is telling you no to something you know that he's okay with. Okay with from the sense of, in general, what you're doing is a good thing. But you understand as you walk with God that every good thing is not a God thing. Every good thing is not a God thing. And you don't learn that until you are walking on this road and you realize, then that looks good. Uh, in, in most cases, God might be okay with it. But in certain situations, at certain times, God is not okay with that. And so God does that to us, I think, purposely because he wants to see, are you going to acknowledge the Holy Spirit? Are you going to listen to the Holy Spirit? Are you going to obey and submit your will to the Holy Spirit? Are you going to trust and lean on your own understanding? Or are you going to say, God, I don't understand, but I know you're telling me no. Because there are times when God will tell you no. He's not telling you not to minister. Watch this. He told them, I don't want you to minister there. God is helping us, y'all, because he's helping us to get in the place where we are more efficient and we are more effective and, and we are in a place where he can truly use us and the power of God can truly be seen. Uh, so he is, 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 you know, the Bible talks about there's a, a wide road that leads to destruction and there is a narrow road that leads to, to life. And if you start walking with God, you realize you like this and there's a lot of stuff you be doing and you ain't even convicted about and you don't have no problem with it and you let stuff go. But the more and the cl you walk with God and the closer you get to God, that road goes like this. It gets narrower and narrower, more narrow and more narrow, and then you find yourself, God, I can't do nothing, God. No, no, he wants to make you more effective and more efficient and more powerful. You can't be powerful out here. You all over the place. You unstable. You, you're you're wa wavering. You, you're selling from here to here. You're doing your own thing half the time. He can't be effective in your life. He got to bring you wow. to a narrow place where he says, this is the way you should go. Walk in this way. God is putting us on a target. So he's not telling them don't preach. He's telling them don't preach there. He's not telling them not to minister at all. He's saying don't minister over there. Not this place, not these people. I got somebody. See, listen, God has to teach us. Listen to what I'm going to say. I did not call you to everyone. God, that was good. If you didn't come for nothing else, leave with that. God's got to teach us I did not call you to everyone. Somebody going to get free today in here. I did not call you to save everybody. I got people I want to send you to, specifically a divine appointment. They need to hear what you got to say. You're the one I want to use in this situation with this person in this place. And I can't do it if you on your own thinking I can do it anytime I want, wherever I want to do, however I want to do it. Because while you over there doing God's work, God is over here saying, what you doing over there? <laughs> I don't need you over there. I need you here. I need you here. <laughs> everything, like I said, looks good on this earth to you, but not everything is God for you. God knows what's best. God is specific, and God is not a waster of time. Is there anybody in here, you done lived long enough, and you done wasted enough time, and you don't want to waste no more time? I ain't got no time to waste. Look at your neighbor and say, I, ain't, I don't have no more time to waste. I need God to direct me. I need God to pinpoint me in the direction I need to go. I need God to put me in the place I need to be. I need God to take me down the path I need to go. I don't have time to be wasting. 
God is not a waster of time, and God is trying to bring us to a place where we are no longer wasters of his time. God has divine appointments for us. God has a will he wants us to accomplish. God knows exactly where the fruit is. God knows where the soul is that he wants to save. God knows about the deliverance he wants to bring about. God knows where the healing is for the chosen one. I'm almost done. God wants to order our steps. He wants us to stop looking for him to move in places he never sent us. And, and to people he never told us to talk to. He said, stop looking in places I never sent you. And stop going to people I never told you to talk to. Oh, help us, God. He said, I don't want you wasting my time or your time. I want you to find out where I am and where I want you to be so you can be effective, you can be efficient, and you can be fruitful. God says, I want you to go where I send you and do what I tell you. When the disciples here tried to go to several places, the Spirit said no. Now watch this, I'm gonna end with this. When the Spirit says no, I want you to hear this, this is every uh, facet of life, not just in ministry. When the Spirit of God says no, he never says no without him having a yes. He says no because it's no here and it's yes somewhere else. You got to wait between the no and the yes. And our problem is when he says no, we get in a hurry, we're impatient, and we, that's where we make our mistakes. Instead of waiting for the no to turn into a yes, we gonna make the no turn into a yes. I'm gonna make this no be a yes before it's all over with. I'm gonna do it my way, God, because I want a yes here. And God said, no, if I'm telling you a no here, it's because I got a yes over there. The yes I know is going to be work for you. I, the yes I know is going to be effective. The yes I know is going to bless your life. Yes, I know you're going to be a blessing to somebody else. The yes is going to catapult you to another level. But you can't get the yes until you learn how to deal with the no. I won't show you the yes until you learn how to submit to the no. God, who am I preaching to today? God have mercy. I, I can't open the door for the yes until you learn how to accept no. There's a whole bunch of believers who don't like to hear the word no. Not from people and not from God. But I'm telling you, God sent me with this word that he changed at the last minute to let you know when the Spirit says no, it's a no until he says yes. yes. I got to finish, guys. I got to finish, guys. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. The Spirit will reveal what his perfect will is. The Spirit led them after they said, he won't let us go here. I guess we're not supposed to go here. Again, he won't let us go there. I guess we're not supposed to go there. They submitted, and they just said, well, let's just keep going and let's, until, he, until he says yes. And while they said, let's keep going until he says yes, that night God gives Paul a vision of a man in Macedonia who is saying, Please come over here and help us. See, see, he needed to be in Macedonia. But he never would have got to Macedonia to help the man God wanted him to help had he been over here in Bija and Troas and all these other places, Bithynia, Galatia. He'd have missed his appointment. And God don't want you to miss your appointment. 
God loves you enough that he sent the Holy Spirit that says if you're led by the Spirit, you won't miss your, uh, I don't know who, I feel like, look, somebody here, you done missed enough appointments. If I'm talking to you, you need to stand on your feet and tell the Lord, I'm not going to miss his appointment. I'm not missing my next appointment. Ah, God, I am not going to miss it. I'm going to take your no when you say no. I'm going to listen to your yes when you say yes. I am not going to miss my divine appointment that you have for my life. God. Oh, if you can receive that, embrace that, something's going to happen in your life right now. The enemy's been trying to trick you. The enemy's been trying to trick you. The enemy's been trying to trick you. But God said, I broke, I broke the deception today. I'm breaking the deception today. You're not going to miss your appointment this time. In Jesus' name, I rebuke the devourer. He is not going to eat your fruit this time. He is not going to steal from your house this time. You're going to meet your divine appointment this time. You're not going to miss another one. I declare it. I declare it. God, I declare 